1998, a tattered and moldy thirteenth-century prayer book sold for two million dollars at Christie's in New York to an anonymous bidder. Experts knew the prayers were written over an earlier Greek text, but no one thought more could be learned. Almost ten years later, a team at the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore, using cutting-edge imaging techniques, discovered several lost works of Greek mathematician Archimedes, who died in 212 B.C. The story is told in the Archimedes Codex, first printed in England in May 2007, and now available in 16 languages. Book TV visited the Walters Art Museum to learn more about Archimedes, the history of science, and how a team of volunteers read through the 13th century prayer book to find a hidden treasure. We are with William Noel, co-author of the Archimedes Codex. Mr. Noel, could you tell us where we are right now? Yeah, we are in uh, a climate-controlled vault in downtown Baltimore. Uh, in the storage area of the Walters Art Museum. Now the Walters Art Museum contains 55 centuries of art that was bequeathed to the city of Baltimore in 1937 and it was the largest bequest ever made by an individual to a, to a municipality in American history. Um, the collection is truly splendid and my job is to uh, look after, to research into and to teach from and to publish about the extraordinary collection of illuminated manuscripts and rare books that he collected. One of my jobs is to follow the sales in New York at Christie's of the, uh, of the various auctions and the Archimedes. And I, and I heard that an extraordinary book was for auction on the 28th of October 1998 and it was the unique source for two treaties by Archimedes, the method and the stomachian, that you couldn't read because the text had been scraped off and overwritten with a prayer book. And this and this book was bought by two million, uh, for $2 million by an American private collector. Who was Archimedes? Archimedes uh, died in 212 BC in Syracuse in Sicily. And by the time that he died, uh, he'd written about ten treaties of astonishing brilliance. Now, when you think about ancient mathematics, you might be thinking of Euclid and the elements of geometry. The elements of geometry, Euclid's of elements of geometry, were child's play for Archimedes. He was an extraordinarily brilliant and inventive man. Archimedes wrote the blueprint for modern science. Archimedes was the first guy to say, in a sense, um, pick up a pencil and a piece of paper, think about something, and you can fi find something true about the physical external world and that's the foundation of modern physics. Now you might think for example that modern science is about is about experiment uh, but it's founded on abstract mathematical proof. So if you're trying to find the center of gravity say of a triangle there are various ways to do it. Uh, you could cut out a lot of triangles and hang them from the ceiling until they bounce flat. Or you can do what Archimedes does, is he draws a couple of lines on the triangle and then he says, it must be there because geometrically speaking it simply can't be anywhere else. So this has to be the case. Then you don't have to experiment hanging triangles, then you can just hang a triangle. Yeah, but if you can just hang a triangle, you can just build a bridge, you can just also launch a rocket to the moon. You know, Newton couldn't weigh the planets. He couldn't experiment. He worked it out on pure mathematics. Most beautiful result ever. But it's based on Archimedean principles. And that's why Archimedes, in a nutshell, is so important to, to, to Western science. And that's why this book is, um, you know, despite its appearances, is I don't know, the most romantic book I've ever handled. I've handled a few. This is just the greatest thing. We have very few, very little evidence of his text surviving. In fact, everything we know about Archimedes, we know about from three books. The first of which was lost in 1311. The second of which was lost in 1564. And the third of which came up for auction at Christie's on the 28th of October 1998 and was bought by a private American.
it's my job, part of my job, to follow the sales in New York. And so I told the director of the museum um, about this extraordinary book, and he asked me to see if I could get it to the Walters for exhibition. So I wrote to a uh, colleague I know called Simon Finch, and to cut a very long story short, the owner came here, into this room, uh, on the 19th of January, 1999. And uh, I showed him some of the books from the collection, and uh, he left it with me. And uh, ever since then, I've been directing a project to retrieve not just the Archimedes text in the books, but all the texts that were obliterated in the 13th century by being overwritten. And uh, it's ironic, really, that this book that has demanded a lot of my attention over the last 10 years is a private book, because the Walters contains 1,000 beautiful illuminated manuscripts uh, that uh, I curate for the benefit of the public and which are, belong to the public. When the book was sold at auction, there were three people who were interested in it. There was the Greek government who wanted to buy it because Archimedes is Greek, after all. Um, there was the Greek patriarch in Jerusalem who thought that the book had been stolen from his library uh, in 1921. Um, and there was the owner of the Archimedes Palimpsest. Now, none of these people knew particularly all that much about Archimedes. If you'd asked a scholar in, um, at, the, at the time of the auction how important was this book, they'd have said, it's astonishingly important because it's a fabulous relic. But two things. It was read by a great scholar in 1906, someone called Johann Ludwig Heiberg, to whom we are all hugely indebted. And he was a genius, and the, idea, and the thought was that he would have recovered most of the things in the book. And the other thing is that the book has suffered so badly since 1906 that the thought was that we couldn't possibly do better now than we had in 1906. And I'm just going to show you how badly this book has suffered since 1906. The best reason that everyone was sceptical was that the book had been appallingly badly treated since... Uh, it was read by Heiberg in 1906, and this is the worst example. When Heiberg looked at this and read the Archimedes text on this page, there was no painting there. Uh, this is a forgery uh, that was put on sometime after 1938. We know it was after 1938 because there's a particular green pigment called thalocyanine green that the conservator of the manuscript, Abigail Quant, found out was not commercially available um, except in Germany and after 1938. So on this page, if we're going to read more than Heiberg, we have to read, read through this forged icon. It looks medieval. It's made after 1938. And there are four pages like this in the book. And this is one of the most important pages. It's folio 27. It's the introduction to the unique surviving copy of the method of mechanical theorems where Archimedes explains what he's doing uniquely in this book. And that was our challenge, and it was a very tall order, and ten years later we're here to tell you that we read through that. I mean, we had to go to the Stanford Synchrotron Radiation Laboratory at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center to do it, um, but that's what we did, and that's the story that we tell in the book. You have your own book, which is why we're here with Book TV. Uh, the Archimedes Codex, How a Medieval Prayer Book is Revealing the True Genius of Antiquity's Greatest Scientist. Uh, what will people find in that? Uh, they will find uh, chapters that alternate between me and Reviel Netz, the professor, of, uh, the professor of Classics at Stanford. I talk about the history of the book and the history of the project and he talks about Archimedes, his mathematics, and the discoveries that we found in the book. It's designed for a general reader, so there are no footnotes, but we hope that it's, you know, really accessible to, to, to a general audience, because this book has attracted uh, the interest of many people throughout the world. What they won't find is the name of the owner of the book. We keep that to ourselves. But he's as generous as he is anonymous. Archimedes wrote his texts in the third century BC, and I trace this story in the book because it's a fun story. Uh, and uh, the method he wrote to his friend in Egypt, Eratosthenes, who was actually the uh, librarian of uh, the great library in Alexandria, 
And he wrote it to Eratosthenes because, you know, very few people were going to understand this letter, which was the method of mechanical theorem. So he wrote it on a scroll because uh, they didn't have the book form, the codex form as we know it today. A codex is just, uh, it's a book, a bound book between books. So they wrote on rolls. And Archimedes wrote his text on rolls. And he sent it to Eratosthenes at the Library of Alexandria in, in about 230 BC. And Eratosthenes would have had it copied by various scribes and he'd have stored a copy in the Library of Alexandria. 300 years later, the book form, as we know it today, is invented. And believe it or not, this is one of a number of hurdles that all texts from the ancient world have to get through to be here today. They have to go from scroll to codex, just as we have to go, for, as our songs have to go from 78 RPM records to 33 RPM records to cassette tape to DVD to whatever the next MP3 thing is going to be. Someone has to care enough about the text at each stage to get it there. Someone had to care enough about Archimedes to get him there. And that guy's name was somebody called Eutokios. And Eutokios put Archimedes into books in, in the early 5th century. And then, then if you think about um, one city that's important for the survival of ancient texts, it's not actually the Library of Alexandria. It's the city of Constantinople which was founded in the early 4th century by Constantine the Great. And it's the one city of the ancient world that survived unmolested into the Middle Ages. The barbarians never sacked it. Alexandria gone, Rome gone, Athens gone. The world, the ancient world is collapsing. Homer, uh, copies of Homer, copies of Archimedes, copies of Plato, they're disappearing all over the world, but they're surviving in Constantinople. And for a very great many ancient texts, it's, uh, Constantinople was the Ark of the Classics. And uh, for a great many ancient texts, we have manuscripts made in Constantinople, just one or two, that are witness to the uh, greatest thoughts of antiquity, from Aristotle to Demosthenes to uh, Plato to Lysias to... Um, Archimedes. Constantinople in the 10th century was a pretty good place to be. It was a center of art and culture. It was the center of a large empire and founded by Basil II. It was the, it was the sort of place that could indulge, frankly, in the minutiae of abstract mathematics. 300 years later, um, the situation was entirely different. You know, um, in 1204, there was a crusade to the Holy Land by, by Western European Christians. They wanted to liberate Jerusalem. And uh, the trouble was, they stopped short of the way and they sacked Constantinople in 1204. And if Constantinople was the Ark of the Classics, the sack of Constantinople in 1204 uh, is the greatest tragedy that ever happened to the world of learning. Don't worry about the Library of Alexandria. 1204 is where we lose so many ancient texts. And Archimedes just survived. Um, this manuscript ended up in Jerusalem. And it was in Jerusalem uh, that it was taken apart, along with several other manuscripts, and overwritten with a prayer book. And by looking very carefully at our images, we could find out when this was done. Uh, the prayer book was finished on the 14th of April, 1229. So Archimedes disappeared, along with Hyperides and the other ancient texts, in the month immediately preceding um, the 14th of April, 1229. And he did it in Jerusalem. And we know that because these texts are specific to Christian rites in Jerusalem in the early, in the early 13th century. I mean, well, what is a palimpsest? Why is this a palimpsest? So a palimpsest is a book where it's been written once and then the text has been scraped off and written over again. You have to be 
a manuscript expert to, to know which bits of parchment are important and which aren't, and how best they serve a function. So I'm, not, I'm handling this manuscript with less delicacy than I've handled others. It's an it's a important thing insofar as it is a choir book from the 16th century, and it's worthy of some respect, but it's been cut up so we only have individual leaves of it. Now, it's, it's made of parchment, not, not paper, and parchment is processed animal skin. So, um, it's the stuff that your leather shoes are made of, but processed slightly differently. It has a hair side and a flesh side, and the hair side is sort of yellow, and the flesh side is sort of white. And I don't know that if you can see, but just along here, down here, it's dark. That's where the backbone of the animal was. And... Um, and it's tough. And this is why the, the, the scribe of the prayer book could scrape off his original text. It's not like scraping off paper. You can, you can scrape and scrape with a knife, and you're still left with a text. And that's, and that's what happened. So medieval books, I'm afraid, were written very often on the backs of animals. And that's another extraordinary thing, that the mind of Archimedes survives on the backs of goats that were actually ga grazing in Constantinople in the year 1000. And these goats still survive. I say they're the most important goats in the history of Western science. So imagine this as a medieval book, and it's bound. And it's got text on it. And it's in sheets like that. And what happens is that you, dis you take it apart. You just take all the sheets apart, you take the covers off, and you scrape off all the text. And then you tear the sheets in half, down their, down their center folds. I should have done this earlier, like one of those cooks. And then you refold it, and you write over it at right angles to the original text. And of course the old book can be in any order whatsoever, and is in any order whatsoever. And this happened to uh, a manuscript of Archimedes, and so if you look at this leaf here, if I turn it around this way, you'll be able to see that you've got two pages from a prayer book, and the text is running in, down like that, and the spine was in the, is in the middle down there. Yeah, the, cut, the center of the book is there. But it was made from one page of Archimedes. Now this page is in remarkably good condition, and you might actually be able to see the Archimedes text. It's in two columns running sort of down like that, and if you go into the center of the prayer book in the middle, you might be able to see a little bit of Archimedes' text uninterrupted by the text of the prayer book. Now, in most, now in most pages of the Archimedes' manuscript, it's, it's more or less obliterated. And frankly, that's why it only made two million dollars at auction in 1998. Two million dollars is, is not a great deal for a medieval manuscript that contains the un is the unique source for the brain of one of the greatest scientists who ever lived. Um, but this book is a wreck. Now, uh, I'm an expert in illuminated manuscripts, I'm an expert in Latin manuscripts, I'm not an, an expert in illegible Greek manuscripts written by the world's greatest scientist. The wonderful thing about medieval manuscripts is that they take you straight into the world that someone saw in the Middle Ages. So, this is a little book that was made in Oxford in England by an artist called William de Brailles in about 1250. And if you want to know how people thought about God making the world in 1250, uh, there it is. This is a tiny little prayer book that was made for a private individual and one of my favorite in illustrations is Noah and the Ark. Noah and his family are on the top floor, and an angel is helping all the, an the final animals load into the ark um, before the flood comes. And it's, you know, this guy is a truly masterful storyteller. 
So we are in the world of medieval manuscripts, a world in which everything is written and made by hand. And this is one distinction that we must understand if we're going to go any further, because printed books were printed in editions. So this is the first edition of Euclid. And um, it was printed by Earhart Ratdolt in Venice in 1482. And if you open it up to the first page here, you can see that these wonderful diagrams in the margin and there you can see it says punctus, and there it says linear, and in Latin it explains that the shortest distance between any two points is a straight line. Now there are three, th this, this, the print run on, on this book was quite large, and so you can imagine that there are many other copies of this book in America, all over the world now, and that's the power of the printing press. But when everything is made entirely by hand, each manuscript is a unique handwritten object. Often it's a consummate work of art. Uh, I like to think of them all as marks of lives well spent. Um, and each one is unique and each one is valuable in its own right. Um, and what's important to remember is that the people who made these books were very often not writing texts for the first time. They were copying other texts. So in the Middle Ages scribes were copyists, they weren't authors. Normally in medieval books, you know, the scribes go first and they copy another text. And so the scribe uh, is copying this text. And if you look at the bottom of the page, uh, he missed out a line, so he wrote it in. And then the artist came along and he drew this character here, pulling up that line with a rope and inserting it into the right place in the text. And when you get that, you suddenly realize that you've understood a 13th century joke. And the page comes alive. And whenever you look at any of these pages that I'm going to show you from now on, you must imagine them as handwritten and the potential for thought to be viewed and understood in these pages is, is more or less limitless. And you're dealing with the real fabric of history and often with the stuff of legend. And with Archimedes, it is legend. I mean, a lot of Archimedes is legendary. Jumping out of the bath, the Eureka, when he says, Eureka, I found it, jumped out of the bath. It's very sweet. It's indicative of a really clever character. But it's the texts that he wrote, the treaties that he wrote, that are so, that are so important. My job, I suppose I took it on for myself, but the owner was very happy that I did, was to put together a team of people um, to conserve the book um, because it's in appalling condition. It suffered very badly from mold. Uh, it's been in a fire. Um, and to image the book, to bring out the undertext so that people can read them. And then to find the scholars to work on them and then to publish the result. And I've been doing this for 10 years and the book's about that story. Um, and everything is, everything is funded actually by the, by the owner of the book. People often ask me how much he spent on the project in 10 years. And uh, when he left the book with me, he said he didn't want to spend any more on the project than he'd spent on the manuscript in the first place. And I think we're getting pretty close by now. So he, he is, remains in anonymous, you refer to him as Mr. B yeah. in the book. Why would he spend $2.2 million on this? Why has he funded this 10-year project to, uh, to research uh, what's underneath the prayer book? Well, he has, a, um, he has built up over the last several years one of the greatest collections of books in this country. And uh, I think the Archimedes uh, is the centerpiece of that. He's particularly interested in, in science material. Um, and Archimedes is the foundation of the Western tradition of, of physics as we know it today. And this is the unique source for, for two treaties by Archimedes and the only original Greek version of On Floating Bodies. I mean, it may be a physical wreck, but it's an extraordinary thing, an extraordinarily important thing. And when he bought it, actually, he knew full well that what this book needed uh, was a campaign that he could fund to bring out the text and make it publicly available for free to everybody. This is one page from the book that the um, owner of the Archimedes Palimpsest left with me when he came to visit me that day. Um, when he 
brought it here, it was a bound codex of about 174 pages. And in order to, um, to get technology, get a method to read underneath, you had a contest of sorts, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Um, we had a contest to see, um, to, to come up with the best possible um, way of imaging uh, these, these leaves to bring out the undertext. And um, so we had two teams working in competition. Um, one was headed by um, Bill Christens Barry from the Applied Physics Lab, lo local to here actually, and the other by uh, Roger Easton and Keith Knox, who uh, are at the Rochester Institute of Technology, or they were at the time. And uh, they both decided that they would concentrate on a technique called multispectral imaging. Now, multispectral imaging is a, uh, is a technique that is, I think, not too difficult to explain. Light comes in different wavelengths. And if you look at something in infrared light, you see the warmth of the body. If you look at something in, um, in red light, then you see something that it, different from something if you look at something in blue light. Uh, the idea is that if you take pictures of a one object in these different wave bands of light, it will look different. And if you can stack them up digitally in a computer, these different wave bands of light, then you can write algorithms or recipes to bring out what you want. You can bring the undertext forward and make the overtext disappear. That's the theory. And after five years of trying, that was the practice. And you know, you can look at before and after photos of, uh, of the Archimedes Palimpsest now, and very often it's difficult to tell that they're the same page. And eventually, um, using a technique pro um, perfected by Keith Knox, who's now at the Boeing Corporation on Maui. And he spends most of his time, I think, looking at small objects in the sky that we can't talk about. Um, he, uh, he, uh, we, we developed a, 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 an algorithm that the scholars find extremely useful. And what they found um, really caused a true sensation uh, for two reasons. One is that we found out new things about Archimedes, revolutionary things about Archimedes. But we also found out that some of these texts in the, in the Archimedes palimpsest weren't, weren't by Archimedes at all. They were from other books. And you know what? They were just as sensational as the Archimedes. And this is another book. Uh, this is from, it's all part of the same prayer book, but, it, but the palimpsested material underneath um, is different, and I don't know if you can see this on camera, but I pointed out that the Archimedes text was written in two columns, and um, the, uh, this text is written in only one column, and you might be able to see it in the gutter. It goes all the way along without a gap. And Natalie Chernetsker in Cambridge finally could read, with the help of our images, that this is actually part of a speech that was originally given um, by a man called Hyperides, who was a contemporary of the ancient philosopher Aristotle. And it was given, um, and it concerned Alexander the Great and Philip of Macedon, who had just recently, at the Battle of Chironia, destroyed the political power of Athens and Thebes. Uh, so it's a foundational text for uh, the history of Western democracy after a tragic defeat. Hyperides, who was the author of the speech, was the sort of Donald Rumsfeld of his day. Uh, he had to defend his policy that wasn't working terribly well. And, uh, and he did a pretty good job. He got away with it, and uh, he was acquitted of his, of his problem. And, uh, but this is the only place that you can find this speech in the world. Hyperides doesn't exist in any other codex, um, a codex being a bamboo. And, to, you know, you have to read the book, but to unfold, we found more and more of these extraordinarily important texts. Now, here's a, here's a truth. There's normally a very good reason to scrub off a text. It's because it's boring. There are lots of palimpsests in the world, and the vast majority of them, the text was scrubbed off because they're not important. And now, we have three or perhaps four unique texts of staggering importance from the ancient world.
in this, in, in this one codex. This makes it the most important palimpsest in the world by far. By far. Uh, and it is romantic and wonderful that in the 21st century we are in the position of editing texts that were speeches that were given in the 3rd century BC and have never been seen since. It is just the coolest thing since sliced bread. Uh, the prayer book was finished on the 14th of April, 1229. Two things about this. It was eight weeks after Frederick II, the wonder of the world, Stupor Mundi, uh, had liberated Jerusalem from Muslim control. So when this scribe was writing his text, he, was, he was probably had joy in his heart. And when he signed the book, um, he signed it on the 14th of April, 1229, uh, which is the date before, the date, it's Easter Saturday. And it was a time in the Christian world for giving gifts. And so this man gave this gift to, probably to a church in Jerusalem. And I don't know how you're thinking about the scribe now, uh, but after 10 years of working quite closely with him, uh, I have nothing but admiration for him, or nothing but thanks anyway. Because in truth, although it looked in the short term like he was obliterating Archimedes, obliterating Hyperides and the other ancient texts, he was actually uh, providing them with a Christian disguise that allowed them to uh, survive the centuries. And if it was love of mathematics that preserved Archimedes from 212 BC, to 1229. It was love of God that preserved Archimedes in this Christian disguise until he could be discovered and reappreciated in the early 20th century. Uh, he wasn't burnt. He wasn't used to brew beer. This book was looked after extremely well until the 20th century. If you look at the dissolution of the monasteries or the French Revolution, you know, what happened to manuscripts is absolutely heinous. Um, let me show you a couple of things that happened to manuscripts. So books have their fate, and you might think that the Archimedes has had a strange fate. It's had a very lucky fate. If you look at this book, it's a printed book. It was printed in Augs Augsburg in 1521. It's in rather good condition. But look at the binding. The binding is actually the remains of a medieval prayer book, which has been totally, totally disappeared. Manuscripts get reused in all sorts of different ways. And to be reincorporated into a palimpsest so completely is actually a wonderful, wonderful thing. And the most important thing is that it was looked after carefully for 700 years until Heiberg found it. It was in a monastery in the Holy Land called St. Sabas, uh, and then it was in a monastery in Constantinople. And that's where it was discovered by Johann Ludwig Heiberg. Now the sad thing is what happened to this book in the 20th century, uh, because it suffered very badly from mold. Uh, and four pages were painted over with forgeries. And just to entice your readers, there are three pages missing. And we know that these pages have forgeries on them. Now, if you can find one of those forgeries, they look rather like this. Uh, you need to get in touch with me. Uh, because we can read through that and we will find unique Archimedes text. And just in case you're venal, I know someone who's prepared to pay quite a lot of money uh, if you can find one of those leaves. So if you've got anything medieval on your wall or that looks medieval, please go and turn off your TV sets and look at it now and get back to me on www.archimedespalimpsest.org. Contact us. I want to show you, yes, I want to show you uh, a very important diagram which um, you can find in the book that I've written. And I should tell you a bit about my colleague who wrote the book, Reviel Netz. He's the professor of ancient science at Stanford University. And the thing that particularly interested him about this book, even though other scholars were skeptical, was the diagrams. Because, as Reviel points out, ancient mathematicians, 
They don't think in sentences. They think in diagrams. Mathematicians think in diagrams. And the diagram was the interface of ancient science. If mathematics today is written in equations, um, mathematics in the ancient world was written in diagrams. And this book is the unique source for the diagrams that Archimedes drew in the sand in Syracuse in the third century BC. I am holding the only place in the world where you can see Archimedes' diagram for the method of mechanical theorems Proposition 1. And uh, what's wonderful about this diagram is that using it, Archimedes is uh, able to prove that a parabola is four-thirds the triangle that encloses it. Now, for those of you that aren't mathematicians, that might have just left you a little speechless. But, but the reason that's important is that a parabola is a curved surface. It's a curved line containing a, containing, a, containing a surface. And a triangle is a straight one. Now, when you're trying to find the areas of straight-sided figures, it's very, very easy. You can imagine how easy it is. It's a square, it's a triangle, it's a polygon. You know, you break it down, you can work out the area of this thing. But as soon as you've got a circle or a sphere, you've got a real problem. How are you going to do that? And Archimedes does this precisely three times in three different ways. He tells you that a triangle, that a, parab that a parabola is four-thirds the area of the triangle that it encloses. This is not a fudge. This is absolutely exactly the area. And you can work out the triangle's area, you work out the parabola's area. He does this in three, in three different ways. So Archimedes has worked out the surfaces of curved figures. He's worked out the centers of gravity of curved figures, of hyperboloids and things like that. And to work out so much about curved surfaces means that, you know, he's, he's building the foundations of calculus here. So when Galileo come, comes along, uh, he cites nobody with so much reverence and so many times as Archimedes. Archimedes is the foundation for Galileo, for Leibniz, for Newton. And uh, actually, this is the most important foundational document in the history of science that you are looking at. Your uh, co-author, yeah. what was his interest in this project? Well, he came, he came because he was interested in the diagrams. He stayed because when he started reading the text, he realized that uh, there was an awful lot more to find out. And you know, one of the most difficult things that as project director I've had to do in trying to explain this, 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 this extraordinary story to the world is to tell people how brilliant this man, Johann Ludwig Heiberg, was, who read the book in 1906. And, and also to say that we have gone beyond Heiberg in significant ways. Now, I'll give you three significant ways that are sort of tangible and you can count. The first page of the book is on floating bodies in the original Greek. It's very, very badly damaged. Heiberg simply didn't realize that it was on floating bodies in the original Greek. And with our imaging techniques, we have uh, transcribed two new pages of the final proposition of on floating bodies in the original Greek that Heiberg didn't even know were that. Uh, another thing is that Heiberg was uh, a philologist. A philologist is a lover of language. He wasn't particularly interested in the diagrams. And so he had a colleague draw up the diagrams from the text. Um, but the diagrams convey an awful lot of information about how Archimedes was thinking beyond what the text does. So actually looking at the diagrams as geographical entity, ge geometric entities in their own right, can tell you a great deal about how Archimedes thought and how ancient science went about their business. And then using the modern technologies that we have, uh, we have been able to reinterpret uh, some crucial passages both in the method of mechanical theorems that exists in this book and in the Stomachian, which I will also talk about. We have one page of it in this book. And you have to read the book, but 
the most important thing I think that we've discovered, Reviel, Nets would say, uh, is that we find Archimedes dealing with absolute infinite numbers. Everyone knew that the Greeks dealt with potential infinity. Think of a number and you can always add to it. You, however big it is, you can add another one and add another one. Think of a number as big as you like or as small as you like. But, no one, but they never dealt with absolute infinity. It's a big leap. The sum of all the numbers, the sum of all the numbers, all the numbers, just the sum of it. That's the end. That's the, that's the, you know, the bidding war stops. That's absolute infinity. And we found that Archimedes is dealing with absolute infinity. And that makes him much nearer to modern conceptions of the calculus than we ever thought that he, that he was. Uh, it's a breathtakingly clever thing, too. It's in Method Proposition 14. Twelve years ago, this, this book was in a basement in Paris, slowly being neglected. And now, uh, it's made the transition from book to digital uh, in style. And we've discovered not only new things about, hyper, uh, about Archimedes, but about other authors from the ancient world. And, you know, the other thing is that we've had a great deal of fun doing it. I'm the curator of manuscripts at the Walters Art Museum. I have other books to advocate for, as well as the Archimedes. And Archimedes happens at the weekends, normally. Uh, and Mike Toth volunteers for the project. Um, the images, you know, it, this, is, this is their weekend stuff. This is their fun stuff. And it's a sort of a group of, a group of friends of Archimedes who... Um, you know, who've dedicated their weekends for the last 10 years to getting this right. And um, at the head of us all, we're led by, you know, a very rich, very interested uh, patron. One of the things that uh, really matters to the owner of the book is that the results of our work uh, will be uh, publicly available for free on the internet. And we've set ourselves the deadline of um, April of October the 29th, 2008, to put all our images and our transcriptions on the web. Um, that's what we're working very hard at now. Um, Reviel is busy transcribing, so he's not interviewing today. But hopefully everyone will be able to look at our images and the text that we got from them. Uh, for free on the web, uh, which is an exciting prospect, I think. Log on to www.archimedespalimpsest.org to learn more about this book and the Archimedes Project.